Right. Um, one of Miracle's important legacies is the debt break. And I was wondering if you could just, in two or three sentences, explain what is the debt break, what does it mean? First, I disagree. It's not, not her legacy. It is the legacy of politicians from all parties, um, aside of the left, uh, that said after the, uh, um, after the uh, banking and euro crisis, if we don't reduce our possibilities in, in uh, doing debt, then it will grow and grow and grow, and we get all the problems that countries like Greece had at that time that other European countries probably are going to have. So it's a little bit what, what the Supreme Court would call political self-restraint. To say hey, there is a two-thirds majority that says we can do more debt on the federal level than 0.35% of the GDP, round about 11 billion euros. And to make that clear what that means, we have a budget on the federal level of 450 billion euros. Plus, we have on the lender level and on the municipality level another 450 uh, billion euros. So by that, it means you can't just simply say, OK, we have a problem. Let's spend and let's do debt, and that's the solution. With one exception, of course, if you have times as these with corona, with a pandemic, then the majority of the Bundestag, of the members of the Bundestag, so not a simple majority, but a qualified majority can decide to have more debt, but then has to repay it after uh, the pandemic is over. So it is really something like it's not as easy to spend as it is in other countries. Mm -hmm. So there's other parties like the Greens that wanted to get rid of the debt break. Yeah. Um, whereas your party, the FDP, is adamant about keeping it. Why? Um, well, you can ask yourself. Is debt a problem? Let's say she's got a debt of 1 million euros. Is Leonie that, is, uh, yeah. she gets into debt easily. Yeah, but if she has a 1 million debt, is it a problem for her? His first reaction would be, yes. But there's a problem for the public sector. Public sector doesn't have to pay back because he always get, gets new bonds he can send out and get money. So if she knows she doesn't have to pay back the debt, you, see, you would see her if you, you don't see her from behind, but you would see her smiling. Oh, I don't have to pay back. But second one is interest rate. If the interest rates are low, and she would only pay interest, let's say, of, of, of 500 euros per year, she still smile. But if the interest rate would go up because inflation goes up, or for whatever reason, suddenly she has to pay 10,000 euros per year, or even 50,000 euros per year, you don't see her smiling anymore. And now comes politics. Politics always means that the one who gives you what you want is more like than the one, like what I as a budget guy very often even do with my own people, say, no, we can't afford, we can't do, or we have to raise taxes and you have to tell those people who pay that they are going to pay. So psychology shows, oh, it's better if you say, hey, you want a better university, you get it. You want better environment, you get it. You want better traffic, better public transportation, you get it. And this is, this is where the problem comes, because as a politician then, if you only have a certain amount of money, it's the same as, as for you as well, if you only have a certain amount of money, you have to decide what is more important. Is it more important to get a better computer to learn good, or is it more important to travel to Italy, for example, and, and have a great, great summer vacation or something like that? I, you know where the answer probably would be, but this is, what this is what politics is about. So I would not disagree that the Greens have the right ideas, but you can't have all the ideas. It's, it's not, yeah, let, let's get what, what we want, because and then, and I'm going to stop, because we go back to her, 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 her uh, million of, of, of deficit that, they ha that she has. The moment that you can't control your deficit anymore and interest rates, rates go up, you're doomed. And this is a situation where everybody says it's not going to come, it's not going to happen. But the, the moment it's going to come, we are in deep problems. Greece was in deep problems. I don't want to know what would have happened in Greece if the European Union, which I strongly support, wouldn't have been there. And this is what the whole deal is about. And this is why some parties say, for good reasons, not for bad reasons, I don't like a debt break because then I can't do all the promises I make.
You called it a constraint for politician, and it seems very weird to me that we have so much trust in our politicians to make so many decisions about so many things, but then we're talking about borrowing, we suddenly say, no, we can't trust you, we do not have faith in your capabilities to make smart decisions. Um, why only on this specific issue? If we have faith in them in everything else, why can't we trust them to handle money responsibly? Do we really trust politicians? Is it really so, or is it just that we trust them for a certain amount of time? And isn't it in our democracies the way that very often after four years, it changes, and in, in, in modern times it even changes more often, because suddenly, and very often I hear that, oh, you promised this and that and that, and this didn't happen, so I'm not going to vote for you again. The interesting thing is, do we trust that politicians really do what they promise? I, I don't know the answer. I know the answer for myself, but you really have to ask yourself the same question too. Is it really so that you do believe if somebody says, I'm going to spend more money on environment, I'm going to lower the taxes, I'm going to build more, more um, trains, um, and I'm going to build more houses, and I'm going to do this, and nobody has to pay for that. And the problem is, why is that so important? Because there is an issue that many people don't like and very often push aside, and that is time. Because if now I decide to promise to give you a better way of studying, better university buildings, probably you don't have to pay for going to the university, then you're gonna like it. The question is, when do I have to pay it back? When is it paid back? And this is why the trust is so dangerous. So yes, there could be people you can trust, but I always say, it's a question you have to ask yourself. Do you trust yourself that you always do the, make the right decisions and don't make mistakes? And that you follow the e don't follow the easy way? So we shouldn't trust politicians in normal cases either, but it is the best alternative? Yes, it uh, might sound stupid, but in a democracy, I think that is the good thing. We can distrust politicians publicly all the time. And, and that is why, for example, I think it's so important that budget that numbers get out to the public so that everybody can read, okay, somebody says he wants to do this, I can really find out how much it's going to cost. He doesn't say where he gets the money from, does he probably get it from me? Give you an example. People very often say, oh yeah, we should do this in our municipality because I don't pay taxes for the municipality. In Germany, for example, they think it's just the employer, but that probably then at the end, because there's not enough money, the, the um, VAT tax, BTV, Mehrwertsteuer in German, is going to go up, go up and hit, hit everyone, is then not seen. And we had that result, for example, in the beginning of 2000s, where suddenly there was not enough money, and suddenly we had a 3% hike uh, in, in the VAT. You've been talking a lot about why debt is bad, but actually a lot of economic institutions, like the IMF, like the... OECD, very famous economists like Joseph Stieglitz and Adam Tooze, one of which is a Nobel Prize winner. The other one was a guest at Room for Discussion, so I'm saying they're equally important. <laughs> um, but all of them saying that austerity hasn't worked in the past, that it's oh, actually... Oh, austerity is something different. Sorry, <laughs> I'll, I'll rephrase. The majority of them are saying that loaning right now as government, having some debt right now, is not as dangerous as other people saying that it is. And it's actually right now the time to invest, especially before the corona, the time to invest in order to make sure that your economy can grow later on. Okay, here's a long answer, because this is really important. I don't disagree with these guys, but there is one problem. Do they know where the interest rates are going to be in one year, in two years, in three years? So what are these guys going to tell me when I do too much debt? and suddenly say to the people, oh, sorry, inflation went up, sorry, interest rates went up. We need, like for example, for Germany that would mean if the interest rates for Germany in average would go up 1% with a debt, just to say that, of 1.5 trillion, that would mean 15 billion euros per year just for interest rates, 15 billion. So you can think about how much universities you can, you can spend by that. The, the correct answer is, Austerity is for itself stupid. To have a balanced budget for itself is stupid. But to make as much debt as possible is as stupid too. I just want to go back to her with, with her million debt. The question we haven't asked, and you probably should have asked her, what did she do with the million? Because that is important. 
the, the question is, did she, for example, buy a house here in Amsterdam, let's say Prinzengracht, some of the slubby area, blah, 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 <laughs> and, and it was very cheap, and now it's worth three million. Then you'd say, oh, great investment. Did she do it to get a tuition to, to, or to, to get to Harvard or to do this or that? Great idea to do that because later with all the things she can do, having studied here and studying then there, she can pay the money back. The question about investment is how much is possible? This doesn't mean austerity. This doesn't mean balanced budget. But it means also where do you spend it for? And this is where you really have to look with politicians. When you make debt, does that then mean that compared to before you spent more in investment? No problem. You spent more on solar, more on wind, more on, on, on grids or anything, I'm fine. But what happens if you just spend it, for example, to say, oh, you only have to work till 65? Or if you spend it um, to do additional things uh, in the health insurance? Is that an investment in the future? So that you would say a debt would be okay if only we would invest it properly. And here we go. This is why I find the German debt break so good because it says, it doesn't say no debt. It says 0 0.35 means, yes, you can make debt because it is good to invest at a certain amount compared to how large, how strong your economy is. You can discuss, is it 0 0.35, which is 15 billion per year uh, of debt? Is it 0 0.5, or what is it? I mean, there's people saying 2% um, could be a better uh, yeah. number, and that, that, that would mean you know dozens of billions, and right now is the time we need big investments, isn't it? Okay, let's say you're right. It is 2%, that would be good. So you think it's the public sector that is going to be the big investor and then is going to build very good investment for the future. I don't see private uh, investors building schools, building highways, building, I, I use, uh, fighting yeah. climate change, okay. shutting oh, down coal. So, so you think private investors are not going to do climate change. Wh what part of climate change is the public sector going to do? Is it going to say, okay, I built new autobahns and then you can drive without producing carbon dioxide? No, it's going to be car producers that are going to invest money to make new cars that are carbon dioxide free. It's going to be the steel industry that is going to invest into new ways of, uh, of producing steel without carbon dioxide. And here's one thing where you can say, oh, he's a liberal, I don't believe him. But look for your country. How much of the investment in the country is by the public sector? How much investment in the country is by the private sector? Now, normally, and if, if you ever read, and I like this book, Kahneman, Thinking Slow, Thinking Fast, you do a parallelity. You do, okay, um, in, in, in the Netherlands, as in Germany, it's around about 50-50 public sector, private sector. So investment must be 50-50. Fact in Germany is, and that is not Otto Fricke, this is the so-called Wirtschaftsweisen, um, so five professors sent from all directions. The investment is eight to nine, versus one. Private sector has nine times as much investment. So even if you say, oh, let the public sector invest more, A, it's not going to be efficient. B, it's going to take a long, long time. You, if, if we really want to change this continent in the question of, of carbon dioxide, you can only do this if you tell the private sector, here, folks, this is where you have to invest. And if you will look at the coalition treaty that is just right now coming out, or at 3 o'clock to be precise, you will find that even the Greens accepted that it is not the public sector. Yes, they have to invest more too. There is a deficit spending, but it was not a deficit spending in total. It was less and less investment spending and more and more other ways of spending. Mm -hmm. But it's, there is a right of regulation within this coalition treaty that helps A, Others to see, oh, now I have to invest because if I invest now into carbon dioxide free or reduce technology or into digitalization, this is where I get the best tax uh, possibilities uh, within the next years. Okay. So I think we can agree, of course, the private sector needs to invest. If we stay with the public sector for just a, mm -hmm. a minute longer, uh, Germany has a debt to GDP ratio of roughly 70, just a bit above yeah. 70%. Japan? Also, a rich and pretty well-functioning economy has a debt-to-GDP ratio of 250%. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, 
Doesn't this mean there's a lot of room for Germany? Yeah, and Argentina had one of 30% and is bankrupt. <laughs> so the number itself doesn't say a lot. The question is, do you have an aging society where the debt belongs to the older people? Do you have a young society um, that is developing and growing? Or do you have a society, as most of the middle European societies are, where you have to be really cautious what is the right way of debt? I don't know if, if it is 60, the master criteria of 60, if that is right. Personally, but that's my personal opinion, not the one of my party, I think 60 is old days debt. Because the more differentiated our economy is, um, the more debt is necessary um, to, to make investments, to, to use them, and to, to spend now and earn later. Uh, because otherwise, in competition, you fall behind. But that is very much going into detail. What, if we get a change there on the European level, I don't know, possible, um, but probably you're going to argue against those who say, no, it has been good, we shouldn't change it. I would argue you always have to find out what is the right way of, of, of using debt for what. We're again at the question, what did you do with the million? Right now, um, The Economist has published an article a couple days ago saying that there are many people in Berlin, many institutions, many parties even, that are trying to find loopholes around the debt break. So even if the debt break in itself is a good thing, they are making plans to, for example, go on a borrowing binge of 500 billion euros in the next year in order to pay for a lot of plans because they don't want that debt break. Isn't this a sign that the debt break in itself is ineffective if Berlin's own institutions don't want to adhere to this rule? If you would find that in the coalition treaty, you're right. <laughs> but, um, and again, I must say, this is what the Greens suggested in their campaign plan. This is what they said in the beginning of the coalition talks. What they now said is that they want 50 billion of additional investments every year the next 10 years. But suddenly it was not the public sector anymore, as they said, and suddenly the way of what is investment is differentiating. Give you another example why investment is such a difficult thing. If I build a bridge, a new one, it's an investment. If I repair an old one, by definition, it's not an investment. It's not on Frigge's rules, it's European rule. If I have lump sum solution, just to go into detail, it would, would be an investment. But, give an example, if I buy a new helicopter, military helicopter, According to German law, it's not an investment. According to European law, it's an investment. If I get a new professor, a, a possibility of having a new professor at a university, it's not an investment. Th the idea of what an investment is, we really have to see, is more 19th century than 21st century. And that's another problem. Um, but we still keep the old idea of what an investment is, because at the end, again, here we go, why debt break and why, why trust or mistrust is so important for me. You will have people that say, a very good welfare system is the best investment into the future, and that's why it is an investment if you raise uh, uh, a welfare support, for example. So you always have that discussion. The political debate of our society has to be, uh, where do we want to go to? Uh, how much can we afford? Do we really want to risk that our debt probably at a certain time could kill us or not? Um, and, and the question for politicians, again, is, um, how much do you say, yeah, you get what you want, and how much do you say, this is what we have to focus on? Hmm. Now, the debt break may be one of your, let's say, more conservative ideas. You also have some pretty revolutionary ones. So let's uh, talk a bit about Germany's big problems at the moment. First off, digitalization. Uh, we're behind on pretty much everything, always on the bottom of the list when it comes to broadband, mobile data, uh, Wi-Fi, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, why? Why are we so behind? Um, for the non-Germans, you know what's the best way of sending uh, a Word document uh, from one guy to the other guy in another city? Fax. Fax. There <laughs> you go. You, you print it, you fax it, and the other one reads it, and that's fine. I might give you an example why it is that way. Germans are not as pro-tech guys as one thinks. Yes, we're engineers, inventors, and everything, but the majority of a society is not a tech-friendly society. You could see that with mobile phones. 
in, in, in the United States, when mobile phones came up, it was going like, oh, great, mobile phones, I want one. Let's see what they can do in boom, 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 to a certain height. In Scandinavia, it was, oh, mobile phones could help us with that. In rural areas, is good. Yeah, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. Germans, mobile phone, do I need this? Really? No, I, I can sell stocks along the mobile phone. I don't do stocks along the mobile phone. Yeah, but I can do this, I can do that. Oh, and I want this, and I want that, and I want that. German mentality is not geared to new technology. Some say, yeah, but with cars. Yeah, but cars is the same. Um, the, the, the electrical cars from Tesla are great. To a certain degree, if you look at the technology, if you look at the way they're built, somebody who's really into car building would say, yeah, good, but not a real quality. Great ideas, great technology, not the quality. Now, what do the Germans do? They say, oh, let's wait if it's really good or not, and then we put this in, that, and that, and, and, and at the end, they have great cars. Whether they're too late here or not, this is what the market will show in the future. But this is the problem we have with digitalization. I think, and my party thinks, that there should be a law that says if things can easily be done digital, they have to be done digital. Mm -hmm. And the problem here is the public sector is the one that is the worst there, because they always say, oh, no, no, according to, to our rules, where we don't have to change to a new technology, we got judges that do say, oh, I'm still not going, I'm just going just to speak somewhere in and somebody else is going to write it for me. They, they refuse. That is the big problem that Germany has, because inside we still consider us to be the great tech guys, which we are not anymore. Mm -hmm. One thing you, you, you have proposed is the so-called digital, the, the Ministry of Digital Transformation. Are we going to see that? And no. Would it help? No, we're not going to see that. No majority for that. Um, the the um, SPD and the Greens had, and as you recognize, please, politics, there is no right and wrong. At least that's my opinion. If somebody tells you this is right and this is wrong in politics, don't follow him. If he says this is better because or this is worse because, then start to think about it. And, and the argumentation was, and we followed that, is if we do a new ministry, before this ministry really works, it's going to take one and a half years. So what we better do, we focus and concentrate digitization in one already existing ministry. And you're going to find that in the, in the coalition treaty, how we're going to do that and where this is going to happen. Um, and I think that's an, that's an okay compromise. Okay. Now, one maybe even bigger issue, obviously, is climate change. It's, Everybody. it's one of the three essentials. It's the three essentials for Germany are the three Ds. Digitalization, demographics, and decarbonization. Right. Uh, decarbonization. You say decarb decarbonization. I mean, we could also disagree and say that climate change is more than just yeah, carbon, right. right? But I just do it for the three Ds. But <laughs> <Okay>. Nice alliteration. <laughs> yeah. um, what's your number one solution in the fight against climate change? Mine or, or the, the FDPs? Yeah, the, FD, the FDPs is uh, we have the Paris uh, Treaty goals, we have the IPCC, that's what we have to do. No, no, no discussion. And then the way we do it is what is the most efficient way to get rid of carbon dioxide and other gases and so on as fast as possible? So where, with what investment do we get as much reducement of, of carbon dioxide? So that is more a technological goal, A, eh? and this is, of course, a procedural one. That's why you have to give a carbon dioxide a price. And this works. It really works. People very often forget that. Um, I come from a town called Krefeld, part of the town Uerdingen. I grew up from my room, my, my kid's room. I could, if I'd run fast enough, I could jump into the Rhine River. The Rhine River was a dirty river in the 70s. And then they said, okay, because there you could see it, so every year we're going to make people pay more if they pollute the Rhine. So for, for industry, but also for cities, things got more and more expensive. And that's when industry decided, oh, maybe we don't pollute the Rhine. Maybe it's even things in the water that we have there that we can use for other things. And the cities did build up... Um, how you say that, uh, uh, cleaning uh, uh, facilities to clean the water. Yes, paid uh, by the people who put the water in the sewage. So that was a solution. And every year is what's getting harder. And this is why for us it is important that the price for carbon dioxide is going up and that we have a market solution there that really shows, 
okay, if I really try to have less carbon dioxide that is polluted, I really save money. And that is the number one issue. Number two issue is, of course, then you have to go to electrification and you have to do uh, um, as well uh, um, hydrogen. Mm -hmm. These are the two things yet that you definitely have to do. And there is one problem in Germany. The price of electricity is, includes the subsidies for building up windmills and solar. That is why electricity is too expensive. So what you're probably going to see at 3 o'clock in the coalition treaty is that this subsidy is taken away from the, the price of electricity and is going along in another way along the budget. And this helps then, on the one hand side, to make carbon dioxide more and more expensive and electricity less expensive. And by this helps, again, to say, OK, if this is going that way, probably I should invest. If this is going that way, probably I should buy an, an electrical car and not, not uh, a, a diesel or a plug-in. Right. Um, all three parties agree there should be a price for carbon. But the Greens propose a much higher price than the FDP does. Do they simply care more about the climate? I don't know where they know the price from. I, I, know, th I, don't, I know what the, the price is not made by a politician. The price was, is made at the end by Paris and what the IPCC said. This is how we have to reduce. And if you only allow to have a certain amount of carbon dioxide to pollute, then the, and too many want it, the price goes higher even than the greens. If people say, oh, the price is already high, it's, it's better to invest, and suddenly you have less carbon dioxide because it's too expensive, it's going to be less. Yes, I know that's market economy. Yes, I know many people don't like if market economy works, but you have to define the market economy because if you don't have a market economy, if you try to fix politically things and you go away just from the question how much carbon dioxide, this is when it starts. And suddenly somebody says, okay, we're going to go higher with the carbon dioxide prices. Does that then mean automatically you invest more or does it lead to problems of carbon leakage of of uh, companies going into other countries because when they have the next investment round, they're going to say, yeah, but the carbon dioxide price over there is lower and, and we probably uh, we export a lot, so probably we're going to produce already there. I think make a market, show it, keep it clear, and the one who just crosses the border just one millimeter, really hammer on him because he made something wrong, so punish him, make him pay for that, but have a clear rule that works. I always, I always see when people know, and that is... People means private persons as well as people and companies. When they know what they, where, the, where things are going to, they adapt. Mm -hmm. The Greens often make the future sound pretty apocalyptic. Uh, they're saying we need to completely change our way of life. You know, you, all of us need to live different lives, consume much less energy. Uh, whereas the FDP sometimes sort of makes it sound as if we didn't really have to give up that much uh, to achieve our climate goals. Can we really solve climate change without changing our lives? No, of course not. Of course not. If we decide to say, I still want to drive with my VW Beetle from 1970 and, and want to pollute the environment, we can't. If I still decide on... Uh, even if it costs more, I still will drive my diesel. Whatever happens in the next years, of course not. The question is, what do we change? Do we change the goal of our life? Do we change the pursuit of happiness that we want to follow? Or do we change the way we get there? And this is very important. This is, again, when we talked about use and why they vote. Our party said, you still can follow your dreams Sounds a little, I know it sounds a little bit high, but you can still follow your dreams. But keep in mind, this means technology change. This means, of course, thinking about whether it is really has to happen that way or not. Give you an example. I think that is, of course, environmentally more friendly if you eat less meat. Probably if you don't eat meat. Yes. But is it working just by the way, oh, the solution is no, you can't do it? Or is it by giving an example? by showing, by leading, a little bit by nudging. It's always the question, where is it nudging and when is it the finger? Um, um, this is where you have to be cautious. And, and again, I think many of the ideas how we save our environment are in, in, in probably your brains and, and probably in five to 10 years are the solution for something. Um, this, is, this is really something we have to think about. Um, and I, 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 
my, my deep belief is if you just tell somebody, no, I'm, we're not going to do this, then mentality-wise, either he says, I don't care, danger for democracy, or he says, okay, I do. What I want is um, we have to fix this, and this is when the brains start to work. If I can summarize kind of the plans the FDP right now has, is that you wanted to have a ministry of finance, you do care a lot about climate, so you probably want to invest in that. I have read your party plan, I know you want to build schools, you want to make highways, you want to invest in the education of the poor. It seems like you have a lot of very ambitious plans, but also a lot of very expensive plans. We have covered that you don't want to get rid of the debt break, the FDP is notorious for not wanting to increase taxes. Where do you want to get the money from? Because we're against raising taxes, doesn't mean we get less taxes or that we don't get more taxes. Which is very often forgotten is that if you raise taxes, it might be at short sight you get more money in the public sector. The second one is what happens with the economic growth. And the problem that we have is that Germany within Europe, if you look at the growth last year, this year, we're falling way behind. So where does that come from? And if we had more growth, and this is something that is very interesting, 1% um, more growth leads to round about uh, 10 billion, 11 billion more uh, tax income plus investments that are, that are going to happen because you have the growth and so on. So the question really is, if I believe in growth, and I do, but it's the question, what is the quality of growth? I don't believe in growth as just more, 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 but I believe in growth as better, 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 re recognize the three Ds again, two Ds and one C, okay? Uh, then, then, then that'll work. The other way around to believe that it is politics that knows what is the right way, I don't believe in that because whenever politics did that, even when we were in government FT FTP, where we said this is economically the right way, we failed. I think it's time for some audience questions. If there are people who have some questions, you can raise your hand and Casper will bring a microphone. Um, the girl in the green sweater over there. Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, oh sorry. <laughs> um, I keep coming back to the similar question as uh, was asked before. I feel like the FTP is giving me this feeling of, you know, with climate change, we're going to solve it with market solutions. It's going to be okay. We have some innovations coming up. We just have to think about it. But I feel like it's, it's way more serious, and you're not taking it seriously enough. So I feel like by not, not saying that to us, not telling us, yes, your life has to change dramatically in the near future, uh, you just kind of postpone that. And I think it would be a way more honest way of telling us, yes, you will have to travel less. Yes, you will have to reduce how much meat you eat. And why don't you do that? Why do you think the market that kind of got us into this, this like more, more, more economy, it kind of got us into that mess that we are in now. So yeah, what do you have to say to that? So you would consider the market being what? <laughs> Being, being, being false, being stupid. The market at the end is us. You are, with your decisions too. A. B, going to the question of travel, just to give an example. If somebody has a house, and he has solar panels on the house, and he has his electric car, and he uses this car to travel every weekend, from the Ruhr area to Egmont an See, or whatever. He doesn't pollute any carbon dioxide at all. Does he have really, is it, is it necessary that he has to travel less? Or meat, if at the end, because we invest, because we do more, we go away from producing meat by having so many animals, killing these animals, and so on, and we get into artificial production of meat where we don't have the carbon dioxide problem, not the methane problem, and so on, which, by the way, is the way bigger one in this one. Is it then really so that we still have to say, okay, even, even though it's not the way as it was, even though there's no, no, no harm for animals anymore, still we don't have to do it. I think 
we, 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 we're too short-sighted. We, we're not creative anymore in how to solve the problems. The same, same thing, that's why I saw it with the Rhine River. We did it, and we did it by market solution. We didn't do it by forbidding uh, uh, just simply to pollute, but by giving it a price. The, the important thing about market is, I know that a majority, probably of all of you say, oh, market, oh. If we accept that we are the market, if we take influence on the market, then, and, and we have clear rules for the market, then it is the best solution because it sets free all the, all the power that we do have in our brains, in our mentality to do these things. Yes, of course, the complete answer on um, what the solution for the FTP is, is not that one, but this is always, if you have time, please read the FTP principles. You will find a lot of solutions in that. But you are completely right. The danger, of course, is that even my party says, ah, it's the market, that's the solution, that's it. But you really have to go into details. In the next four years, a lot of the debates will go around, is this something, for example, where we support? Is this something where we give, give, a, give a, a tax redemption? Is this really reducing carbon, the carbon dioxide, yes or no? Um, can we drive cars by hydrogen, or is it probably better we do it for trucks, because for cars it's not so good? Or do we leave it to the market whether it's good for cars or for trucks, depending on who wants to be carbon dioxide free or not? So yes, there is no easy answer. And probably the pure sentence is leave it to the market is, of course, no solution at all. But it's always a question of how much time. All right. Uh, we have time for one more relatively short uh, audience question. Elmer, please. Yeah, so the FTP posits itself as a really pro-business party. Great, by the way. I was just wondering what your general opinion is on the record amounts of venture capital that are coming into Europe. And do you think it will actually allow European companies to have more international relevancy and competitive ability against China and the United States? Or do you think it will still be kind of, you know, companies will stay a little bit overvalued but then eventually be acquired by the U.S. or the way around? Just your general take. This is the actual problem that you all are going to face. Um, and we didn't talk before. Because when I talked about tax, and I talked about write-offs, and about investment, at the end the question is, will there be money that is going to be invested here in Europe? Is it going to be invested in Germany? Because as you know, if Germany doesn't work, the whole European Union economically has a problem. We, we are the strongest economy-wise. Not in the banking sector, this is what we're leaving to the Netherlands and, and France. Um, but is it just our money? Is it just German investors in Germany, Dutch in, in the Netherlands? No, it's exactly those guys uh, that you mentioned, those who have all the bazillions. And when they decide where are we going to invest, they have three reasons to say, where, where is it a safe way to produce? And this is why China slowly is going into a direction of where they suddenly say, oh, I don't know if I even can, can't even be a tennis player anymore in this country. Why should I invest in this country? B, there is the United States because of all the power that this society still has, not knowing, of course, what will happen when the next presidential elections come up. And three, then there is this Europe. Oh, uh, could we invest there? Yeah, but it's not worth it. And, and they're not growing. And yeah, but it's safe. They have ideas, they have the right people, they have the right education, and tax-wise it works too. This is when it comes. Right now this doesn't happen a lot. I mean, there's one single example I can give you. It's, it's BioNTech. That is the company who has the vaccine that Pfizer is, is promoting all around the world. Yeah, but um, of course, I talked to an investor from the United States. He didn't invest because he never thought that this would ever work in Germany with all these critical things about genetics and everything. But the answer really is, we have to be a place where people say, this is where I invest my money because I think this is where solutions for tomorrow are going to come because they have to be complicated solutions. Within a little bit over an hour, the official coalition talks will be published. We will all know what you guys have found for your new government. Yeah. C can you tell us something? Will you get the finance ministry? Yeah, it looks as if. Um, um, I, can, I can tell you that it, it looks as if we're going to get the finance ministry. Um, I can give it a short sight. Chancellor is coming from the SPD. Surprise, surprise. So it's going <laughs> to be uh, Olaf Scholz. Um, Minister of Interior, which is very strong in Germany, SPD. Defense, SPD. 
um, housing SPD, uh, 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 labor and social affairs SPD, health SPD, and Ministry of uh, um, um, Development Aid SPD. Greens, Ministry for Economy and Climate, Foreign Affairs, Family, um, well, this would be interesting if this would happen here in the Netherlands, Agriculture, uh, Environment, <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we don't talk about uh, nitrogen yet in Germany. We're going to have the problem soon. And environment. FDP, finance, justice, traffic, and um, Bildung und Forschung. Um, uh, education, education. Research. And research. Breaking news right here. I hope there's some newspapers around. Yeah, but it's... it's if you want, you can give us more information. <laughs> you yeah. can also just read out the entire coalition talk. We'd be well, the first one in the world to know. There's one important thing that I can tell you. Um, that is interesting for the Netherlands, too, and other countries, too. When we get the next com commission, the Greens have the right to nominate the next commissioner for Germany, which doesn't mean it is the same role as Ursula von der Leyen, but the next commissioner. Of course, I would say that is okay as long as the FDP can nominate the new ECB president. Then. And can you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. I, I really, to, to be honest, and this is maybe I can really do something that I find important. There is no greater job than being a parliamentarian. It is, on the one hand side, is a, it's hard work and you're criticized from all sides, which is necessary, but there is no place where you can be as curious and get as much information as being a member of parliament. So whatever your plans are, consider this as one that is also very interesting. All right. Um, now, it looks like you, you managed to put your heads together and actually you know, come to a result. But we all know that there's some pretty big ideological differences, Definitely. particularly between the Greens and the FDP. Do you think this new coalition is visionary enough to lead Germany into a new age? A, I would disagree that there is, a, there is so much in between. It's on the goals, there is a lot of things we can agree on. On the way we get there, this is where the difference is. And in certain areas, probably they're going to uh, convince us that their way of is the right, and the others, probably we are going to do that. We have the chance. The problem with politics these days is that you have elections every month. In Germany, you have state elections. I think here in the Netherlands, for example, you have uh, municipality elections in March and something like that. There is always an election going on. And elections are very often like school grades. Oh, oh, he didn't do it that good. This party, I'm not going to vote with this party that way. Yeah, but shouldn't you take at least give them two, hour, two years time? Or shouldn't you decide on this or that? So that is, that is the question that is for this new three-party um, coalition very important whether they still look what their goals really are. And um, th the biggest one is, to my mind, to, to, to tell the German society that she is A, able to do way more than they think they can do, and B, that they are more, now I'd say liberal, but this is not the meaning of politically liberal, but that they are more modern uh, society than they, they, they really think they are. Um, this is going to be uh, the wheat uh, legislation we're going to get. We're going to get wheat being sold in, um, well, it could be coffee shops, but different to the Netherlands, the whole production is going to be in the market and not part of it outside of the market. Here you go again, by the way, why it's not working in the Netherlands, because part of this is not market, but is just, uh, well, criminality. Hmm. Now, we assume you've gotten to know Olaf Scholz Personally, yes. Um, there's a German saying. Um, there's a German saying, um, and here again we go with Merkel. He is pragmatic, yes, but he is. In German, we say um, he's like a pudding. You can't nail him. <laughs> um, um, I always say he's more like uh, um, how you say that. He's even drier, so it's not not wet as pudding. It's it's more like uh, it's it's really difficult. He's a really <laughs> he's a northerner. He is very cautious. He doesn't react emotionally. If you find him laughing, it's more like, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> um, but that's okay. That's okay. Probably I, I, I laugh more stupid. But one thing he really does know, and that is to manage politics. He was a good uh, uh, prime minister in, in Hamburg, um, which at least is, is the second largest city in, 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 in Germany, and a state. So... 
and he knows how to manage that, and he did manage the Ministry of Finance very good. Um, but, um, well, as I said, it's, it's not even a putting, it's a, it's, it's, it's a putting powder you try to uh, fix at the wall, and you can. This is, this is where he's very tricky. So we can't really see a blooming friendship between the <laughs> two of you in the next four years? Uh, I think friendship is not a part of politics. Um, I would even not say it is within your own party very often that you really have friends. Uh, if I may say that, being 56 years old, the question if somebody is really is a friend, we talked about this, you don't find out where, during regular work. Whether someone is really a friend, you will only find out in certain very dangerous situations. Same with friendship as with trust. If you can trust someone or not, you don't find out when you just sit here and have a talk show. Right. Um, <clears throat> question is, uh, of course, there's room for one more audience question before I the end of this yeah. interview. Uh, um, yeah. The green shirt. Um, so my question is a little bit more to the political side. Um, I wanted to ask, where do you see uh, Merkel's party CDU after this new coalition in the opposition? I mean, they haven't been on the opposition for so long. And maybe do you see them getting closer with AFD maybe? Or do you see them more in a supportive position to the new coalition? Like how will CDU after Merkel will be in your opinion? I think it is of utmost importance that we have a strong opposition. Because if we don't have, we're not thinking enough within the coalition. We're not argument, giving enough arguments. We don't look for good solutions because we say, hey, we got the majority, let's do it. A. B. When the FTP fell out of parliament in 2013, the reason we came back, which nobody thought in 14 and even in 15, was that we were able to discuss inside, but to communicate outside in one single way. The Christian Democrats have right up to now just one way of how they communicate to the outside in one single way. That is being aggressive against the not yet in charge coalition. If they continue to follow this way, then it's going to be, they're probably going to go the way that the Christian Democrats here in the Netherlands went or like they went in many other European countries. Third one is, um, I don't think that there is a danger that they lean into the direction of the AFD. Yes, they are conservative, but we really have to be cautious. We very often do this, oh, you're conservative, you're right. If you're right, you're outside of society, which is completely wrong, which is very dangerous too, because it stops discussing about issues that are coming from the conservative side. And I, I personally always do say, you should even discuss about those things that are coming from the extreme right. We should name it, like for example, when in the parliament chambers, somebody is going to say, when we are in charge, we're going to put you in front of whatsoever. You have to discuss about it, you have to name it, you have to say this is wrong because, this is not good because. And I think that CDU is not in, the, in, in danger to act this way. Yet, the problem is, is there still a reason to join a conservative party as a young person, and young I mean up to 30? Because of what? If you say conservative contents of two things, the one is value conservative, then that's okay, because I always say environmentalists are very value conservative. They say how important this old value of the environment and everything is. But the other one is structurally conservative. And I think that is the big problem for, for the Christian Democrats. In a fast changing world, you can't say, oh, we've done it that way the last 10 years, the last 50 years, so we should do it this way the next 10 years too. No, you have to just look what value is behind that. And this is the great danger for a conservative party that she leads to, oh, it has always been that way, why should we change it? Everybody can tell me this, no, I'm going to keep it that way. And this is the, the answer that has to be given by the Christian Democrats. And I'm not sure because there are three people that are going to decide who wants to be the leader, whether the party is going to decide for one of the two of the three that are more progressive. 
and, and but this is what you're going to see in December when they vote uh, on the question who is going to be their new chairman. So would you say that the high times of the CDU are over? No, you never know that in politics. Um, um, if I would have been asked do you th 20 years ago um, when I was a young parliamentarian and I met Mark Rutte who was a young parliamentarian too, somebody would say, me, do you think Mark Rutte could be the longest standing prime minister in, in the Netherlands? I'd say, yeah, stupid, no way. You never know that. You never know that. You don't know, A, how a party is developing, and you don't know who the people are in the leadership. And maybe the last one, and the question whom you see as a just leader, a just leader. You could see that with Sigrid Kaag in the debates here in, in the Netherlands. You could see there's suddenly somebody you never thought he would be a leader, and then he is accepted as a leader, and suddenly his party, her party, is the second largest. Politics. Is the, and that is, it is not as it had been small changes. Those who voted for the FTP, the young ones, they could be gone in, in four years because they think that we did it the wrong way or too superficial. You already mentioned Rutte, and we are in the Netherlands right now. Um, and you have said during previous interviews that you actually think that Germany is behind the Netherlands always a couple of months, politically speaking. What do you mean by that? Um, the Dutch society, especially in the Randstadt, um, I'm not going to talk about BBB voters, but um, is a society that is more dense, that is faster in what is, is happening, in the good as in the bad, to see what are solutions, how are we going to live together, what are our values. Um, when Pim Fortuyn came up here in the Netherlands, you had a debate suddenly about, oh no, we're integrating fine. No, of course you were not integrating fine. There are problems. But name them and solve them, and not name them and say they don't exist, and, and then hope that they're solved by themselves. You can see that on immigration. You can see that on education. You can as well see this on digitalization. You could see how, how you're reacting here. You could see it with all questions about life, end of life, um, a question of organ donorship, uh, and all these things. I, just to give you a, a little hint, I can say that because there are not many Germans, uh, German politicians listening. I very often do copy and paste. I, I look what kind of debates are going on in the second chamber and say, oh, that's a problem we're probably going to have in the Germany in the next six, seven, eight months, next year, two years from now. How are they going to debate? What are the arguments? What could be a solution? And then say, okay, good. I'm, I'm starting um, just by making a proposition in the German parliament. The Netherlands are faster because there is one saying in the Netherlands that is very important and that Dutch people should always be proud of. It's this moet kunnen. Ha has to be possible. Germans more like, is that allowed? And is that allowed <laughs> is German, but it takes longer. Your political persona is often charming. You, your difficult questions seem to slide off of you, kind of like Mark Rutte has as well in the Netherlands. Is this another thing you've copied from us? Mm, I don't know. You never know why, you are, why you're really the way you are. But of course, when, when I look at Dutch politics, I always look, why can somebody deliver his argument? Why is he still accepted? And, and one thing that is very important is that as a politician, you should avoid to, to build up a distance, to be normal. And by the way, my first name is Otto, and in Dutch it's Jan Modal, in, 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 in English it's, uh, uh, I think, average Joe, in German it's Otto Normalverbraucher. <laughs> And, and, and if you just act normal, this helps. And this, of course, I have seen with Mark Rutte, and this is one of the reasons why it's worked. Whether he is a good prime minister or not, this is something the voters have to decide, and they have done it the last times the way they have done it. Probably they're pr going to do it in another way, and a less good way next time, or even better next time. You never know. But what I find important about Dutch politics is that they still try to listen and to argue and not say, ah, uh, I explain what's written in the law and how life is and how the world is turning. Right. <laughs> we don't have that in German, do we? No. Too normal, it's not a thing. Yeah. No. We should. No, we should. We should. All right, no. let's uh, introduce it when we go back home. Normal is verrückt genug, aber. Right, before we let you go, it's been uh, very interesting. We want to challenge you a little bit. Okay. Uh, we've talked about, about a lot of the plans of the FTP, and uh, I have a timer here. You got one minute. 
And uh, we would like you to now dream big. Now's your time to shine. You can uh, really imagine what should Germany be like in 10 years. And uh, yeah, you can have a few seconds to think about it. I'll put on my hands for the last 10 seconds yeah. so you know when you're done. Yeah. All right. Ready? Yeah. Go. I think that in a new speech in 10 years, uh, Chancellor Lindner should really say, joking, uh, the country should be a country that accepts its role within Europe, not as a sole leader, but as part of a leadership team that shows that this continent is, is so great, and I think it's great, that everybody says, this is how I want my country to be. This is, or if I, I don't, can't stay there, this is where I want to go, though, with all the problems that combine, that knows that even though others are probably taking longer, is really the one that goes in front and says, these are the solutions. We might make mistakes, but we're in front again. And the last one is that this European continent is a continent where young people have the ability to follow the way they want to go. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this interview. We thought it was very interesting. Um, for all the others, this was the last interview for Room for Discussion um, after before of this year. After Christmas break, we will be back with Caroline van der Plas, Vera Bergkamp and Rutte Brech Rutger Brechman. Rutte, uh, maybe. If let's hope. <laughs> we can catch him. Maybe you know him, right? I will send him an SMS that they ask for him, for you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, let's have a warm applause for Otto Ficke. <laughs>